Amen. Thank you, Katie. That was a long one. Well done. (laughs) Happy Father's Day again. It's great to be with all of you this morning. Uh, My name is Charlie Dunn, and part of our church vision statement is that we say we want to be the kind of church where we are helping our neighbors to find and follow Jesus. Uh, But sometimes that is more difficult uh, if those neighbors don't have the most positive impression of Jesus' followers. You know, there's a, a Barna study that, that recently found that among those ages, um, really 18 to 29, that among those in that age category, 90% would say that Christians are judgmental. They think they're better than the rest of us. They look down on those who do not share their faith. They have a, a smug superiority towards those who don't share their same faith in Jesus. Now, I think you probably could question, okay, is perception the same thing as reality? Just because somebody perceives that um, sense of superiority doesn't mean that's actually how those Christians feel towards them. And and you certainly maybe could uh, challenge the assumption that simply to believe that there really is absolute right and wrong, truth, and falsehood, all of which is grounded in the character of God, simply to believe that that is true doesn't mean you're judging or condemning or looking down on somebody who doesn't share those same beliefs. But the perception is still there. 90% would say those Christians, they are judgmental. They think they're better than those who don't share their faith in Jesus. And I think if you were to bring that charge against the Old Testament Hebrew prophet named Jonah, the charge would stick. The jury would convict him unanimously, guilty as charged, the sense of of smug superiority towards those who don't share his faith in the God of the Bible. You know, we've been in this teaching series now for the last couple of weeks, even during the scripture reading, Brandy said, are we ever going to read further in the book of Jonah? And uh, the answer is yes, we will move along. It's a 10-week series, though, so there's more to unpack in the first chapter. But we're in this, this series, and you remember, God comes to his prophet Jonah, and he says to him, Jonah... I want you to leave where you live, the the northern kingdom of Israel. I want you to go northeast to the feared and hated Assyrian Empire. And I want you to go to their capital city of Nineveh, and I want you to warn them. These were people who were known for their bloodthirsty violence. And, And God says, Jonah, I want you to go and warn them about their sin. And yet Jonah refuses to do so. And we've talked about the reasons why over the last couple of Sundays, and and at least in part, Jonah doesn't want to go why. Because he does look down on the people of Nineveh. He does feel superior to them, morally superior to them, spiritually superior to them, even racially superior to them. Jonah looks down on the people of Nineveh. He doesn't want to go to them. He doesn't want to be around them. He doesn't want to proclaim God's word to them. He doesn't want to be with them. He certainly does not want for them to experience God's mercy or forgiveness or grace. So he doesn't go. Instead, we said, what does he do? He buys a one-way ticket to go in the exact opposite direction. He's wanting to sail to the the, the furthest most point of the, the Western world, at least at that time that he knew, wants to go to the city of Tarshish. So he gets on this boat, and he starts sailing in that direction. But here's the irony. And I think here's where you see God must have a great sense of humor. Because Jonah doesn't want to go to the people of Nineveh. Why? Because he doesn't want to be around these, these, these pagan people that he looks down on. And yet suddenly, even as he is fleeing, he finds himself on a boat surrounded by who? Pagan people, the very kinds of people that he looks down on. And do you think maybe God is trying to teach Jonah something here? You bet. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, In in many ways, this is one of the major lessons for us to learn from the book of of Jonah. That is, namely, how does God want those who, who believe in the God of the Bible, how does he want us to treat, to respect, and to love those who do not share 
our faith in Jesus. And I think you see that very plainly in this interaction between Jonah and these remarkable sailors on board the ship. And this is an important lesson, I think, for us to learn because people have said, actually, today in the United States, we live in what might be the most religiously, racially diverse nation within the history of the world. Even right here in Lake Highlands, you know, in Richardson ISD, there are 76 different languages that are spoken within Richardson ISD. There's a lot of diversity in your workplace, in your schools, in your neighborhood. We're around people who are different from us, who look different, who believe very different things from us. How does God want us to interact with those who maybe don't share our faith in Jesus? And I think that's a good lesson for those who already are Christians. Even if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, you're not convinced yet, uh, maybe it's helpful for you to hear how God would, would want his people to, to treat those who have different beliefs, and, and perhaps even you will be drawn more towards this God yourself as well. So, uh, three lessons uh, that I want us to take from Jonah's interaction with these sailors in this story this morning. Here's the first one. First lesson. Lesson number one is, is we see in the story that sometimes... Those who don't share our faith in Jesus can actually act, they can behave more nobly, more admirably in various ways than those who do share our faith. Sometimes non-believers can act more nobly and admirably than those who share our faith. As a reminder, you know, Jonah gets on the ship, but what happens shortly after he starts sailing towards Tarshish? is that God sends this storm. We talked about that a lot last Sunday, that this storm is actually not a form of his judgment, but a form of his mercy. It's a severe mercy. It's a way that God is trying to draw Jonah back to himself, who is running away from him. God hurls this storm upon the boat. But now, right, there's this life-threatening storm that is raging around them. And I want you to notice the contrast between Jonah, the man of God's behavior, and the behavior of these sailors who who don't know the true God. Tim Keller draws this out very helpfully in his book, The Prodigal Prophet. He says, notice this contrast. So on the one hand, where is Jonah during the storm? He's asleep. He's below deck. He's not doing anything. But the, the sailors, they're up there throwing cargo overboard. They're working hard, doing everything they can to save the lives of the people on the ship. Jonah is like oblivious to the needs that are all around him, but these these sailors, they are active and they are alert. Jonah seems pretty self-absorbed, wrapped up in his own issues and problems, but these sailors, they're working for the common good of everybody. Jonah is not praying to his God. Even if he knows the true God, the sailors, they're much more willing to pray to their gods. They're even more willing to pray to Jonah's God than Jonah is to his own God. And then you see after they cast lots and they discover that actually Jonah is the one who's responsible for this storm that has come, are they eager to throw him overboard? No. They're asking him questions. They're they're doing everything that they can to avoid having to to, to take the life of this man, to throw him into the sea. At every point in this story, it's actually the non-believing pagan sailors who outshine the Hebrew prophet, the man of God, who are acting more admirably, more nobly. Uh, There's a a commentator, a lady by the name of Phyllis Tribal. She puts it this way. I think this is helpful. She says, in this episode, hope, justice, and integrity, pretty good qualities, reside not with Jonah, but actually with the captain and the sailors. Though blameless victims, the sailors never cry injustice, finding themselves in a dangerous situation not of their making. They seek to solve it for the good of all. Never do they wallow in self-pity, berate an angry God, condemn an arbitrary world, target the culprit Jonah for vengeance, or promote violence as an answer. Those who don't know the true God act and behave better than the man who does. Now, why would this be? 
And some of you say, well, does it make any difference then to know the true God? I mean, should that, that confuse you, confound you, you know, cause you to doubt or question your faith? I don't, I don't think so. And, and here's why. Because what, what our faith teaches us, really from the very beginning pages of the Bible, and, and it's certainly it's repeated in Romans chapter 2, is that every single person on the face of the world today Regardless of their faith, regardless of their religion, regardless of their culture, every person has been created in the image of God. That means they are stamped with something of the character of God, that that implicitly every person knows something of God's character. They know what is right and what is wrong. Paul says this in Romans 2. He says that God's law has been written on every person's heart. So that sometimes, by by nature even, he says, we do the very things that the law requires. Whether somebody knows God or not, whether they believe in God or not, non-Christians, those who don't share our faith, those of other religions, can act in very brave, noble, admirable ways. Maybe you've seen this in your own family. Your own friends who don't share your faith. Maybe you've noticed those who, who, who they might not believe in any God, but they're very devoted parents. They love their children. They sacrifice for their children. Coworkers, maybe, who are are, are great to work with. They they, they do their work well. They do it with integrity. Those maybe your your neighbors, maybe they, they, they cut their trees. They don't throw loud parties. They pick up your mail when you're out of town. They're, they're, they're good neighbors, even if they might not believe in our God. Certainly people in the community who are giving and serving with their time. I think about an organization like Doctors Without Borders. Maybe some of you have heard of that organization. Most of the people in that um, organization, they're, they're not Christians. It's not a faith-based organization, yet they're willing to go to the other side of the world to provide health care for people who otherwise might not have access to it. So many ways, certainly our faith teaches us, because God's law is written on every heart, that that a person out of God's common grace, this is the the theological term for it, God's common grace, this means he he gives good gifts, he gives um, good character to people regardless of whether they believe in him or not. And when we see that in the lives of those who are different from us, who don't share faith, we should should celebrate it. We should praise it as as a reflection of the God who made them. Uh, In fact, uh, Martin Luther, some of you know that name, the the Protestant reformer, uh, he once put it this way. He said, I'd rather be ruled by a wise Turk than by a foolish Christian. I'd rather be ruled by a wise Turk than a foolish Christian. What he meant by that, a Turk in his day was a way of speaking of a Muslim. He's saying, I'd rather have a, a Muslim in government, somebody who is wise and who has good character, and who's going to lead you know, with integrity, that's, that's better than having somebody who, yeah, they call themselves a Christian, but they're, they're kind of inept, they're kind of lazy, they're not really good at what they're doing. On Friday, our um, toilets in our house were not flushing. We had to find a plumber. Uh, Brandy did a great job of, of finding that plumber for us, but um, I'll tell you, when we're looking for a plumber, you want to know what was not our first question? Are they a Christian? That was not our first question. The first question was, are they a good plumber? Are they going to be able to fix our problem? And are they going to do it with with character, with integrity, not going to charge us too much? In God's common grace, he bestows gifts of, of character and skill and ability on various people, whether they believe in him or not. That's his common grace. Now, what common grace does not mean, hear me clearly, Common grace does not mean that all people are or will be saved. People may act in good and noble ways without belief in Jesus, without knowing Jesus, but but good is never good enough. Nobody lives a good enough life up to God's standards. That's also what Paul says, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So the only way that anybody will ever be made right with God, reconciled to a holy God, is through his undeserved grace, through what he has done for us in Jesus, who did live a good enough life for us and died for all of our sins. Saving grace, not common grace, saving grace only comes through trusting in Jesus Christ. And it's only through having the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit within you 
that, that you'll ever live a life, begin to live a life that is truly pleasing to God, not just in our actions, but deep down at a motivational heart level. And yet, I'll tell you what common grace does teach us is it reminds us that, that our non-believing neighbors and friends, they can sometimes live in ways that are more noble and admirable than those who share our faith. It reminds us that, that sometimes um, those of us who, who do know the true God, because of our selfishness, because of our sin, we, we, we live much worse than our right belief in God would lead one to expect. And it reminds us that because of common grace, we should love and respect uh, every person regardless of whether they share our faith or not. That's the first lesson uh, I think we can take away from this interaction between Jonah and these sailors. There's a second lesson. Here's the second lesson. The second lesson is, is this. It's that the world, the world has a right to rebuke the church when the church is failing to use its faith to move us to work for the common good. The world has a right to rebuke the church when we're not using our faith in a way that leads us to work for the common good. So look, look with me at verse 6. So here's Jonah asleep underneath the ship. The storm is raging. So the captain goes below deck. He finds Jonah. He, he wakes him up. And what does he say to him? He says, what do you mean, you sleeper? Don't you love that? What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Any of you who have kids, maybe next time they're, they're sleeping in, you could try saying that to them. What do you mean, you sleeper? But, but essentially what, what he's saying to them what he's saying to Jonah is he's saying, like, like, what are you doing down here? Don't you know that there's this storm raging? This is life or death. Are, are you really that selfish? Are you really that absorbed in your own troubles and problems that, that you're not going to do anything to, to come up here and, and, and try to help us survive the storm? I mean, you, you say that you're a prophet. You say that you're a man of faith. I mean, can't you take your little private faith and, and use it in some way for the, the public good, for the common good of everybody on board this boat. And that's the challenge that this captain is giving to Jonah. And, you know, there's a, there's a, a preacher from the 19th century, a guy by the name of Hugh Martin. I came across this sermon that he preached, and, and I read it this week. It's a, it's a sermon he preached on this passage. It's called The Church, or The World Rebuking the Church. The world rebuking the church. And he says that, that in this story, that the captain of the ship, he represents the, the spiritually lost and broken world who doesn't know the true God. And he says Jonah represents the, the people of God. And the captain comes to, to rebuke Jonah. That, that in many ways, he says, actually, the whole book of Jonah is like, it's like a rebuke that God is giving to his people, the people of Israel, saying, how can you be so indifferent to the needs, to the suffering, to the spiritual lostness of the world around you? The whole book of Jonah is really a rebuke to God's people. But he says that, that essentially, this is his words, the world may rightly rebuke any church that sleeps in sweet oblivion to the problems and the pain of the world around them. And that kind of stings, doesn't it? it? It ought to sting. It's convicting to me, certainly. I mean, I think there's, there's a lot of truth to this, isn't there? That, that as churches, we can, we can sometimes be much more absorbed in ourselves and in our own ministries and in our own programs and our own worship preferences, sometimes in internal theological debates within Christian churches, maybe even it's possible to be more focused on a, on a church renovation project. That surely that wouldn't be the case in, in our situation, no doubt, but, but churches can become pretty internally focused. And, and that can be true for individual Christians too. All of us, you know, you, you, we've all got our own problems, your own responsibilities, your own jobs, your own families. And, and I know that, that some of you in this room right now are facing some really challenging problems. And I don't want to make light of that in the slightest. But it's possible sometimes we become so absorbed with our own problems that we become blind 
uh, to the suffering and the needs of our neighbors around us. I remember somebody once sharing with me, a friend of mine, he was going through a, a long season of depression. And he said actually for him that it was when he started serving at a homeless shelter. It actually helped him to, to break out of some of that depression because he was, he was getting his eyes off of himself. He was thinking about problems and concerns of, of people other than him. But sometimes we become like Jonah. Essentially, we're asleep in the boat, unaware of the needs of, of people around us. Now, now, to be fair, I think that the church and, and Christians throughout the history of the church have, have done a lot to work for the common good. Founding of hospitals and schools and advocacy for, for human rights certainly is part of the church's legacy. Certainly today, um, you know, there's, there's one Pulitzer Prize winning writer. His name is Nicholas Kristof. Here's what he observes. He says, if you go to the front lines at home or abroad, like who, who are the people who are actually in the battles against hunger and malaria and human trafficking or genocide and some of the bravest people you will ever meet, he says, are Christians who are truly living their faith. I, I love here in this example, my, my wife's uh, company, uh, publicly traded company, they, they send a team every year through uh, Living Water, a um, Christian organization to, to, to dig and drill uh, water wells for people who don't have access to fresh, clean water. And, and often they would send teams to El Salvador when it was considered like the murder capital of the world. And, and people were worried, like, should you go to El Salvador, American team, in light of that? And, and, and the organization said, look, they don't bother us. They're glad for us to be there because they know the work that's being done for the common good. The gangs, they leave us alone. And, and I, I know that many of you are, are actively right there on the front lines here in Lake Highlands. You give of your time to serve uh, the needs of our neighbors around us. I know so many of you in the way you just go about your work, in your workplace, you care about your coworkers, you care about your customers, employees, you're working for the common good. I love that. But it's an important question, I think, for us to ask. At every stage of our life as a church, okay, so God's bringing more people into our church family, praise God, we're, we're building out more programs, we certainly are, are doing a lot of great renovations to this, this physical space, but we got to keep asking, okay, what are we doing as a church to work for the common good of our neighbors in Lake Highlands, whether they share our faith or not? I'm thankful to, uh, there's a group of you called the Serve Lake Highlands team recently formed, and they're starting to really ask this question, how are we going to do this more and more as a church as we give our resources, our time? Uh, one great partner organization, Network of Community Ministries, they provide a lot of wraparound services for people all throughout Richardson ISD. I know some of you have, have consistently served over at the mobile food pantry at uh, Thurgood Marshall Elementary this last year. Might be helpful to know, they're, they're not actually there during the summer. The summer, they're over at Merriman Park Elementary at the lunch hour, 1245 to 2. Anybody who wants to go and, and serve there would encourage you to do so, a way to make sure that people have access to, to the, the food and nutrition they need. Uh, another great partnership we've had has been with the schools, so Stoltz Road Elementary School. A lot of you have, have served uh, students and, and teachers there in a variety of different ways. Um, and we're going to continue uh, ways of, of blessing uh, those teachers at Stoltz Road. But as we've uh, found our home to be over here, um, we're, we're going to be forging a new partnership this coming year with North Lake Elementary School. Um, and I'm excited about, we're, we're going to work through a, a Richardson ISD program focused on, on, on reading. And so our reading tutoring is going to be at North Lake. We're hoping to get 25 volunteers to give a half hour a week to go and meet with a student who's struggling to read to help them uh, to be able to, to have the, um, the, the future that in many ways is dictated by, by literacy at an early age. Uh, more to come on that. Uh, we'll look for other partners in Lake Highlands. One that I'm excited about is called Forerunner Mentoring. They're a great Christian ministry in Lake Highlands, really well run. They help to, to pair especially um, Christian men with, with boys who don't have a father figure within their home. I got a text from one church member this week who said, hey, I want to I sign up to be a mentor with Forerunner. I thought, that's amazing. I love that. In a lot of different ways we're going to look for as a church. How do we work for the common good of our neighbors in Lake Highlands? Such an important question for us to be asking. I, I love a story that I came across uh, along these lines 
uh, a few years ago in a book that I was, was reading, and, and, and it, it told the story of um, back in 2004, that's 20 years ago now, but, but if anybody can remember when uh, there was a, a Dutch filmmaker who made a film that was pretty critical of Islam, and as a result, there was a, a, a radical kind of extremist Muslim who, who killed him on his bike in the street. And it led to, to really angry, uh, violent outbursts in the Netherlands, a typically peaceful country where they were um, burning down uh, Muslim schools and, and mosques. There was a lot of anger on account of this. And there was one uh, pastor, he, he was a pretty conservative Christian pastor, a reform pastor, who decided one night he would go to one of these mosques. He went to the mosque and he knocked on the door. They opened the door and people were afraid kind of inside and huddled in fear. And he asked them, he said, I would like to come each night to stand guard outside the mosque. And they were shocked by that. They, they couldn't understand it, but they said, sure, that's okay. And, and so he did. And for three months, every night he came and he stood guard outside the door. He actually recruited a bunch of other Christians to go and stand guard at other mosques near them, too. Now, the media, they were intrigued. <laughs> People wanted to know, why was this Christian pastor willing to do this? And so they came, and they asked him that question. They said, do you, do you have, like, a really good Muslim friend? Do you have some really good Muslim friends? And, and so that led you to do that? And he said, no, I don't really know any Muslims. He said, okay. Uh, and then they asked him, they said, well, do you, do you believe that like all faiths lead to God and you know, each uh, faith is sort of an equally valid way to get to God? He said, no, I don't believe that at all. And they said, okay, well, why are you doing this then? And he said, because Jesus calls me to love my neighbor. And he wanted to work for the, the common good of his neighbors, whether they shared his faith or not. Such a, just a, a beautiful, inspiring example. And I think that's that's part of the lesson we're to take from this, this story is, is God is calling us to use our faith, to say, what am I doing with my faith to work for the good of my neighbors, whether they share my faith or not? But there's one more lesson, one more lesson for us to take from this interaction between Jonah and these sailors, and, and here it is. It's that if, if you are a follower of Jesus, if you are a Christian in this room today, we have, we have something incredible and incredibly unique that we have to share with our our non-believing friends. Namely, that is a way of of relating to God, of knowing God, not primarily on the basis of fear. Do you notice how much fear is in this story? So in verse verse 5, when the storm breaks out, the, the sailors, they are afraid. And then they find out that the reason for the storm is because Jonah is fleeing from God, and it says they are exceedingly afraid. And then even after they've thrown Jonah in the water and the sea immediately calms down, it says, verse 16, that the men feared the Lord exceedingly. I want you to notice that this, this fear is, is really the motivating, it's the, it's the controlling dynamic for the way in which they are approaching and relating with God. Uh, at first, it's their own gods, right? When, when the storm comes, it says they started praying to their own gods. They started crying out, each one to their own God. Why? Because they're afraid. I don't know if these were sailors who prayed a lot. I don't know if they were very devoted to their gods or not, but the storm comes, and they start praying. Storms have a way of doing that, don't they? You think about the storms that came through North Texas recently. You're, you're frightened. You're fearful for your life. What do you do? You start praying, whether it's a, a, a literal storm or it's a figurative storm in your life, just something happens in your life that's really outside of your control. You're brought to the end of yourself. Almost instinctively, people will pray, regardless of what they believe about God. Maybe you've heard that expression, there's no such thing as an atheist in a foxhole. Or maybe you've heard from, from Mark Twain. You know, so Mark Twain um, really did not like Christianity. He was very cynical, disdainful of Christianity. Uh, and yet, autobiographically, he said there was a moment in his life a family member was sick. So what did he do? He started praying. He said, I prayed like a coward. I prayed like a dog. And he hated that. He didn't like that he was praying. He, it, it made him mad because he thought, well, I don't believe in that God, so why am I praying to this God? But almost instinctively, people will, will pray uh, when they are afraid. 
That, that, that often is the case, and certainly that's the case for these, these sailors. They start praying to their gods out of fear. And then they learn about Jonah's God, and, and, and now they're, they're praying to Jonah's God. And I guess that's better, because now they're praying to the, to the true God. But they're still praying out of fear. They're still motivated out of fear, even when it says that the storm has been completely calmed. It says they're exceedingly afraid of the Lord. They feared the Lord exceedingly. These are not men who now are filled with trust in God. They're not approaching God out of trust. They're not approaching God believing that they are deeply loved, that he is their father. Their their religion is driven by what? Fear. And I think that's true for most religion. That's pretty much true for, for nearly all religion. That, that's our, our instinctual way of, of relating to God. It's based on fear. You even see it after the sea is calm. It says, what do they do? They start offering sacrifices. They start making vows. Basically, like, I'm afraid. God, don't do this to me again. If, if you will protect me, if you won't send a storm like this, I won't curse. I won't lie. I won't cheat. I won't do any bad things in my life anymore. I'm making these vows, these sacrifices, saying, God, if I, if I do this, then you'll keep me safe. Then you'll protect me. So much of our religion is driven by fear. And I think that's even true for, for Jonah. You know, Ryan talked about fight or flight earlier in confession time. You think about Jonah, like, why, why is he fleeing? In many ways, because he's afraid of God. He doesn't trust that God really has his best interests in mind, the best interests of his people in mind, that God is really out for his good. Maybe you can obey God out of fear, but you can also run from God out of fear, fear that if I give my life to this God, it's not going to really go well for me. I can't really trust him. Fear. Most of our instincts around dealing with God are based on fear. We only, we only deal with him because we have to, because we're afraid of him. That's true for the sailors, and I think it's true for Jonah, but it doesn't have to be true for us. It doesn't have to be true for, for those of us who know God as he has revealed himself to us in Jesus. You know, there's a, a place in Matthew chapter 12 where Jesus says that someone greater than Jonah is here. We'll talk more about that next Sunday, how Jonah points forward to to Jesus. But just think about that for a moment. Jonah eventually says, throw me overboard. He's willing to sacrifice his life for these other sailors because um, of his sin, right? Because of the consequences of his own sin. And yet Jesus Jesus is far greater than Jonah. He's the one who said, throw me into the world. Throw me ultimately onto the cross to save us, not because of his own sin, but from the consequences of our sin. And why did he do that? Why did he get into our boat to take on our flesh? Why was Jesus willing to to enter into our sorrows? Why was he willing to face the storm of God's judgment? Because of his love for us. Because he loves us. And scripture says perfect love does what? Perfect love casts out fear. That that love of Jesus for us, it it convinces our hearts that that we can open up to God, that we can move towards God, that God can be trusted. We don't have to live in fear of him, but we can actually know him as our father. And that's what Jesus teaches, right? He was the only person to ever say that, that, that you could relate to God as your father. That's how he spoke of God, because God was his father, his eternal father. God the Father, God the Son, the mystery of the Trinity. But Jesus also invites us to know God as our father. That's how he teaches us to pray, even. Matthew chapter 6, he says, don't pray like pagans. They're heaping up words, trying to to, to get God to be on their side, trying to to get his favor. Ultimately, that's fearful prayer. He says, no, pray to God. When you pray, pray to God as your Father, our Father in heaven. Jesus says, "You, you can know God as your Father, Heavenly Father. And of course, today is Father's Day. I don't know if you had a good father, you had a bad father. Some mixture of the two is likely the case in most earthly fathers, probably in those of us who are earthly fathers, but Jesus says you can know a heavenly father who loves you, who wants to run to you, to throw his arms around you, to embrace you, to forgive you, to accept you, to delight in you. 
just as he delights in his eternal son, Jesus, because of what Jesus has done for us, we can come to this God and we can know him not on the basis of fear, but on the basis of his being our father. And listen, friends, do you know what happens when you, when you start approaching God in that way, when you are convinced that he deeply loves you and accepts you and treasures you as your father? It begins to drain out a lot of the judgmentalism, those feelings of, of superiority towards those who don't share our faith. Why? Because a lot of what judgmentalism is, is it's actually driven by fear, insecurity, I don't know where I really stand with God. I don't know if I'm actually good enough for God. I don't know if I'm really okay with God. I'm afraid of that. And so what am I going to do? I'm going to look down on other people. I'm going to compare myself to others as a way to try to silence those fears, to try to help me feel better about myself, to feel like I'm enough, I'm okay. It's a way to push down those fears. But when you know that God loves you and accepts you and approves of you fully in Jesus as your heavenly father. It starts to, to drain out those feelings of superiority. When you know that, that, look, God is my father. I've been adopted into his family. He didn't choose me because I was better. He chose me simply because of his grace. So how, how can I feel superior? How can I look down on those who don't share my faith? And maybe even it moves you knowing that your God was willing to, to give so much. Our Father gave his only son. Jesus gave his life. Maybe you say, you know what, I, I want to give myself more for the, the sake of my neighbors, for their common good, even those who do not share my faith. And you know what happens when we do that? When the church lives into that calling more, Jesus tells us what will happen. Matthew 5, 16, he says that they will see our good deeds and they will give glory to our Father in heaven. And who knows, maybe they will come to know him as their Father as well. And so let's pray toward that end as we come to the Lord's table this morning. Father, we rejoice that Today, we can call you our Father. We get to know you as the God who loves us so much that you are willing to give your only son for us so that we could be adopted into your family. And we come to you today, not running from you in fear, not fighting you in fear, not trying to obey our way into your good graces, but confident that we already are in your good graces through what you have done for us in Jesus, and we remember that at this table. Jesus, we thank you that you laid down your life for us. We see what a costly thing it was that you would die for our sins so that we could be brought into your Father's family. Lord Jesus, we pray that we would become more confident of, of that truth so that Instead of looking down on, on those who don't share our faith, we would want to serve them. We would want to pursue them. We would want to give ourselves more for the, for the common good of those whom you have put in our boat with us, whoever they may be. Father, I pray that as we come to this table this morning, we would trust and believe that you love us as your children. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.